Thank you very much, Sally. It is uh, great to address you again as one of the few Houstonians on this. Let me welcome most of you. I was really surprised that uh, about 90% of you in response to Debbie's question were from outside the city. We're really glad you came. I hope you're enjoying the weather, as the mayor said. And, um, and I'm, I'm also unfortunately sorry that our own local industry <laughs> may not be as well represented here because one of the reasons that we came to Houston was to talk to the oil industry. And I'm sure some of you are from there, but most are not. I really want to uh, commend uh, Steve Andrews and Randy Udall for putting together a program that has coherence uh, and thematic meaning. And usually when you have a conference, it's one thing after the other, but there really is a flow to this. But of course, I have to complain to them because they have given us the worst spot in the whole thing, following one of Houston's great mayors and preceding one of Texas's great entrepreneurs. Uh, it's, a, it's really a challenge to kind of live up to those expectations. It's great, though, because I have to tell you that this, con this, uh, this session, this presentation, has been 14 years in the making. Seth Itzkan came to Houston in 1990 to study with our Future Studies program, graduated in 93, and got back to Boston and immediately got on the telephone and said, you need to go tell those people in Houston that the oil industry is not going to last forever. <laughs> okay, yeah, can you imagine me walking down there, the Greater Houston Partnership and the Chamber of Commerce in 1993 and telling them that, and I said, Seth, hold on, hold on, hold on, and finally, uh, he, uh, he attended the second conference, the ASPO conference, and met Steve and Jim Baldoff, and out of all of that flowed the university sponsorship and indeed this, uh, this conference and this presentation. So I'm really grateful to Seth for setting me up here to be able to talk to you about a vision of Houston after peak oil. Now, I have to tell you that Steve and Jim put the peak in there. Our title was Houston after oil. And the reason I put peak in parenthesis is that Houston after peak oil is not going to be a whole lot different than Houston at before peak oil. Because, as we know, 2 to 3 percent, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, higher prices, et cetera, et cetera. So what I want to do is throw us eventually into Houston after oil. Houston after the oil industry is largely a thing of the past. And that can be anywhere you want to be, any, any date you want to pick. I did the calculations based upon what I heard in the, uh, on yesterday morning from uh, Hirsch and Srebowski. And if you take 2 to 5% decline off the peak, you can do the math very easily. 2% 2 is 2020, 2000, what is that, 35 years, 2045. But 5% is only 2020. Even I, as old as I am, expect to be around in 2020. That would be 50% of oil production compared to today. That's not very far away, a mere 13 years. So somewhere between 2020 and 2045. So I'd like you to imagine yourself uh, talking to a young person in those days, some year, whatever, in Houston, maybe a grandchild if you're, if you're, if you're old, uh, if you're young like, like some of you are, a great-grandchild if you're old like me, but, a, uh, but a, real, a real child of that time, 2030s, 2040s. And imagine they've come across this picture in their history book, and they said, Grandpa or great-grandpa, how in the world did you ever live that way? One of our jobs in future studies is to make the present, the normal, seem unusual. And one of the things I like to do is not to travel, and of course I love to travel to different cultures, but we in future studies travel to different times. We put ourselves in the, in the place of those people looking back on our time and saying, what would it look like to them? We've seen pictures of traffic jams from 1919 and, and old refineries and the Drake uh, oil well and all of those things, and they look so quaint. Well, frankly, we're going to look quaint to them, too. We're going to look unusual. And it's that spirit that I'd like to use for, the, for an hour or so to kind of imagine what it will be like not only living there, but also their view of what we are as a kind of a foreign visitor in that sense. Because in future studies, and frankly the difficulty of this presentation, is that just about everything that needs to be said about the oil industry and its effect on civilization and what the near and the medium term future is has already been said. 
by a lot of people who are a lot smarter than I am. So what I want to do is to reflect and almost perhaps to summarize in a kind of a reflective way, not just the facts, the facts are already out there on the table, but what does it feel like? What does it feel like down here? How is it going to be for you or for your children or grandchildren to live in a world where oil industry is on the serious decline and basically is beginning to be written out of the equation as the primary dominant fuel of its day? Because future studies is not about prediction. It's about the long-term future. Prediction is impossible, even in the next few years. We've heard that already. And therefore, what most people do is they simply give up on it. They say, well, we can't predict, therefore, we don't need to look at it. And we take an opposite view. No, we can't predict, but we need to consider it anyway. And that's why we latch upon the scenario. Now, a scenario sounds like a cop-out. Come on now, you know, get the data right, do the model, do the math, et cetera, et cetera. But the gentleman from the GAO last night said for their GAO report, and he was kind of apologetic, we couldn't really say anything for sure because there was so much uncertainty. And had I been on the panel, I might have challenged him and say, yes, but you could have talked about possibilities. You could have talked about sharp differences in the future that are not necessarily likely, but certainly plausible enough that a prudent population like ourselves should be seriously considering them. As I said, 50% of today's oil production, given the 2 to 5% decline after 2011, is merely 2020 to 2045, frankly not that far away. So what might Houston look like in those times? What might it feel like? We're going to talk a little bit about how we approach the future. I want to give your, the, our visitors a sense of Houston, very short little view of what we think. I've been here 30 years. I have a kind of an outsider's, insider's view of Houston. And then we want to talk about the scenarios in terms of sources, in terms of uses, and indeed in terms of industry. And finally, I want to end up and then say, where are we going today? What's happening here that might get on with that? A few takeaways. Mostly what I hope out of this are not the facts. As I said, you've heard the facts. But insights, feelings, reflections, observations. In the next hour, if you get an aha, that's really what we're after. Because that's what you will carry away from here. That's what you will communicate to your neighbors and your family and your colleagues, is kind of the feeling of what this peak oil thing is about. Not so much the graphs and, and all of that, which are necessary. But the feelings is what we tend to carry away. This is a picture of what we're going through. The S-curve, disruptive change that we're about to, uh, to, uh, to experience where oil, which became the dominant fuel in the, in, the, in, in the world in the early part of the 20th century, in the next decade or so, may relinquish that fuel. And right now, we're in that first phase, which is, oops, I got these backwards. The first phase is no problem. And that's what the world is saying. I told Sally that we, we didn't use the word, we told our students not to put the word futurist on their resume in the 80s and the early 90s because that would have been a huge red flag. And she said, well, we don't use peak oil out there in polite company either <laughs> because it's a, it's a kind of a, it's a, it's a red flag term, right? But an event, the smoking gun that Tom Whip talk, Whipple talked about hasn't occurred yet. It did occur in global warming with inconvenient truth. And maybe I was thinking last night that we might be able to see if Al Gore can catch lightning in a bottle twice. I don't know if anybody's up for producing another movie. But what is going to be the break? And what is going to be the thing? And then we are going to be in, a, in the rapid period of transition. For those who like change, it's as exciting as a roller coaster ride. For those who like the present, it's chaotic and difficult, full of mistakes, and we won't, we, won't, we won't like it at all. But fortunately, in the end, and what in the end is, 30, 40 years from now, we will have achieved, for the second half of the 21st century, a form of life that, believe it or not, the people in that time will be very happy with. I believe they're going to look back on our civilization and say, as I say on the very last slide, I'll give away, nice place to visit, but I wouldn't want to live there that they had a particular kind of way of being with all that energy around and all that stuff, and boy, I'm sure glad we're not doing that anymore. Is that feasible? Is that plausible? I think it is. Because in fact, isn't that the way we are? If our grandparents and great-grandparents knew the pace that we lived, 
knew the requirements that were on our lives, the stresses that we're experiencing, they would say, no thank you. And I think our descendants will think the same thing about us. So, our model of change comes right out of punctuated equilibrium. Many of you are familiar with Stephen Jay Gould, Niles Eldridge, came out called punctuated equilibrium. To use a famous phrase, it's just one thing after the other. One era after the other after the other. And eras is a very powerful concept in future studies because we all know it from history. The Depression was an era, the Victorian period, the Renaissance, bop, 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 you can go on and on. People forget, however, that we are in an era today. And obviously on the subject of this conference, it's the oil era. No era has ever been permanent before, and clearly no era will be permanent today. Everybody agrees with that. All we're doing is disagreeing on when and how this era will change to the next one. What will be the event that causes that type of discontinuity? And so we go from one era to the other in energy because, the, uh, because throughout all of human civilization, we have utilized different forms of energy. And the more energy a society has, the more complex it is. Now we're talking about a society that might actually, and plausibly so, have less energy available to it in total, and particularly with growing population per capita. That would truly be an historic, historic movement. Up till now, our energy has been increasing energy density in every era. And what's the next era going to be? A lot of possibilities, but it really is very, very, uh, it's an important thing to remember that we may not have the energy density available to us on each and every basis. So we look around this room. I mean, uh, I've been sitting here looking at these lights for two days. <laughs> I mean, talk about energy exuberance, you know. I mean, it's just there, and you know, keeping this thing at 55 degrees while we're all wearing coats and sweaters and all this kind of stuff. That's the kind of thing they're going to look back and say, what were you thinking? How, why were you doing this? And we would say, oh, we had it, so we could burn it. Big deal. It was our way of life. We couldn't do it any other way. If you showed up to this conference in shorts and a t-shirt, everybody would think that you're being impolite because it's our way of life. The energy is so embedded. Everybody's concerned, everybody in the, in the, in the conferences said, well, why hasn't, why hasn't demand changed? Why is there no elasticity of demand given $90 and $3 a gallon gasoline, et cetera, et cetera? Because you don't have any alternative. You're gonna go to work? Sure. You're gonna cool your house? Yes. And in fact, it's the whole civilization that has to change before any of us. Now, some of us, we can all do change the lights and buy the Prius and those things. Frankly, as many people have pointed out, those are wonderful, but they are truly, truly marginal. This is going to be a civilizational change of the first order. And this is the picture of that change. Going from a new, an old era to a new era is never pretty and never fun. If a company decides to transform itself, if you decide to redecorate your house, if you decide to build a new freeway, it always involves difficulties, problems throughout. But why do we do it? Because the new era then promises a vision, something better. And in our case, I don't think it's going to be better materially and probably not better on an energy basis because it simply won't be there. I mean, it's not a matter, this is not going to be voluntary. You can't burn what you don't have. And if we don't have it, we're going to obviously have to move and change. So the last thing I want to talk about change in general is you know you are there when you see the world differently. Because of this conference, I'm teaching a course at the University of Houston on the future of energy and the environment. And within that course, I have embedded a lecture series for other people at the university. Some of the students who uh, the dean has uh, sponsored to this are attending that. Steve Andrews was a remote uh, lecturer in that course a few weeks ago. And what I've come to realize is that, is that energy is the, we're not the information age. We are the energy age, and that is what is the era that we're going to be going through. So let's talk about Houston. For those of you who are new to the area, uh, Houston is on the verge of a major, major decision. Pittsburgh, that Detroit, Fort Worth, Lowell, Massachusetts, New Bedford, Massachusetts, were each the commercial center of a major industry of its day. 
we all know what happened to them. Is that, is, that, is that destiny? Is that fate for Houston? Is Houston bound to become the Detroit of the 21st century because the oil industry goes away because of depletion finally wins out over technology? That's a scenario. I don't know the answer. I do hope it doesn't, but there's a very, very good chance that it could. Houston itself is, um, is of course, uh, fourth largest city in the country on the banks of the uh, Galveston Bay in the Gulf of Mexico. This is the sat Landsat satellite picture. You notice the freeways are the things that stand out, and we do love our freeways, of course. Houston is a hub and spoke system, uh, very um, uh, the, the downtown area where we are is the center, and it goes on and on and on. Kind of the poster child for sprawl, of course. I don't really use that word. But we are a hugely low-density city because land is cheap and because regulations are few. This is the city that the marketplace built. People in Houston don't like government. There are some people in Houston who seriously don't know why we even have a government. <laughs> they really believe that the market is, the, is what's going to happen. Just a few stats here before we get almost pushing 5 million people in our SMSA, which is eight county area, uh, 760 people per, per square kilometer. I guess that doesn't mean much to you until you compare it with the most dense part of our country, 10,000 people per square kilometer in New York City. Uh, the economy right now is about 50 percent energy and chemicals, and we'll see in a second that that's up, that's down considerably from what it was 20 years ago. Texas burns more energy than any other state in the country by 50 percent. Twelve quads compared to California's a little more than eight. Fifty percent more energy per capita and seven times the energy per capita in the global world. Tell us we are not using that energy to construct a way of life that is probably unsustainable. 12% more energy intensity than the rest of the U.S. And why do we use so much energy in Texas and in Houston? Well, the energy industry itself is a big consumer. You refine petroleum with you by using heat. It's a distillation process, so there's a huge process of there. The, um, the more transportation, of course, because it's big and spread out, and, of course, with the heat and the humidity, a lot more cooling. Oops, that was back. So, Houston is used to being successful. This is, the, this is the amount that Houston has made money over and above the U.S. and the Texas. We're used to being successful. And since 1983, when almost 85% of the economy was oil, we're now down to 50%. But you see it beginning to tail off a little bit. What else is there? Development, which is not a primary industry, but it's a big business here. Chemicals, I don't know whether they included chemicals in that or not. Lots of trade, some manufacturing, the Texas Medical Center and the space industry. Houston then is an entrepreneurial, individualistic city that is ready for the future. On the other hand, it has some liabilities. It has the oil industry, which is making tons of money right now, and it's very hard to get people to change when they're in the flush of prosperity. We do not, we have excellent business leadership and excellent government leadership, but most people in Houston are individuals. They don't believe so much in collective decisions and whether we can, we can do that. And of course, we have a relatively poor image as the industrial heartland of the U.S., not, not uh, more or less a other kind of a place. So let's turn to, oh, let's turn to, the, uh, to the scenario itself. I'm assume a relatively smooth transition. Supply assumes other non-petroleum resources come on. Demand assumes uh, fair energy efficiencies and the externalities of carbon capture, sequestration, and many things. So this is really the, pretty much the plausible best case. Things break the right way. We kind of get through this okay. There are, of course, a lot of darker cases out there, which I'm not going to consider. The population of Houston is expected to grow by 75 to 175 percent, but that all, of course, assumes that the economic growth goes forward and population grows forward. And I don't know that we can assume that, given the context of this. In terms of stationary energy, there's oil, natural gas, and coal, nuclear, lots of renewables, and lots of storage capacity. These have all been covered. We don't need to go over these. These are all going to be part of the energy mix. Here are some pictures 
that are they're from the future that are going to demonstrate. New energy sources, both on the left, the new renewables, and on the right, the real big picture. Your grandchild will be generating electricity in their home, even though Houston is not particularly good for solar, they'll have solar nevertheless. And lots of devices. My favorite is the right-hand side there. That's a, a little dispenser of methanol that's fueling the fuel cell of that MP3 iPod player. LEDs, OLEDs, all of those, lighting, heating, and we have many more devices that we could talk about. In terms of mobile energy, again, we've been over it, electric, electric, electric. Even the diesel engines will be probably uh, assisted by photovoltaics. The long distance will still be treated by airlines, but shorter distances, I suspect, as Alan pointed out this morning, will be electrified rail. We're not going to jump on Southwest Airlines to go to Dallas. There is no way they can, they can compete with the cost of jet fuel to, to that. So we will have an, an, a rail system in the United States. In terms of demands, uh, obviously, um, the, there, there has to be a lot more efficiency and a lot more transportation efficiency. One of the things that I pointed out and, and the mayor pointed out is simply not going places. A society with a lot less mobility, a society that stays put a lot more. Oh, the places we used to go, the new transportation device of the future. Shopping, schooling, working, entertaining, all done within a fairly small radius area. And then the behavior differences. More natural fabrics, lighter clothes, as I pointed out. We've got some efficiencies, too, in an area and two areas that I want to uh, mention. And then at this point, I'd like to bring up my colleague, Seth Itzkan. Seth has made a study of the building efficiencies that are going on around the world. And they are the new kind of um, lead projects, early signals, we call them early signals of things, how things might be. He's also been talking to people, as Sally said, in, in the Northeast about green chemistry, something that hasn't come to Houston yet, but we certainly hope does. Seth, let me ask you to come on up here and, and uh, give us a few ideas about building efficiencies and green chemistry. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, thanks. Peter, first I'm wondering, are there any members of Red Sox Nation in the audience? <laughs> oh, excellent. Well, um, uh, I told Peter that he's, he's the, uh, the Josh Beckett of this team. So if I get into any trouble, I'm just going to give the ball to him. Um, so first of all, I want to thank um, the ASPO and uh, Jim Baldoff, who was my contact. Um, they've done a, a great job and they're doing a great job. And also I want to thank them for uh, creating this session which looks at this city. And I want to suggest that for the future in whatever uh, city that the ASPO has its conference, they could have a session on the future of that city. So the future of Denver and the future of Chicago, wherever you're going to go next, that could sort of be a, a running theme of the ASPO conference. It's just a su uh, suggestion. Um, Okay, so uh, on this slide here, you see the, um, the sort of the stylized uh, peak oil curve. And um, while Peter was talking, I, I remembered um, years ago, I, I wasn't even thinking of it till just a minute ago, there was a book called um, The Turning Point by Frithjof Kopra, by a physicist named Frithjof Kopra. And uh, he had a drawing in it, or an illustration, and it said, The Oil Era. And his timeline was like 10,000 years or something, and it was just a single line. It wasn't, it wasn't even a curve like this. And uh, it, was, it was a little um, sort of mental jolt. That was almost 30 years ago when I saw that. Um, so there's a futurist for you. His name is Fritjof Kopra, and the book was called The Turning Point. Um, a couple of things I want to just talk about briefly, we'll just go through these quickly are uh, the built trends in the built environment, which can be germane for a low energy economy, and, um, and also in the industry, particular, particularly for Houston, um, the, uh, the biomass chemical industry, which could be a substitution for the petrochemical industry. 
And I'd like to look at these things as opportunities, as opportunities for economic growth. Uh, we could have a conference called uh, Economic Opportunities in a Low-Carbon Economy, because there are a lot of people who are figuring out how to make money. And uh, so I, I like to look at sort of the positive side of things. So, okay, I hit the green button. Fantastic. Um, so we're looking at we're looking in the uh, the built development here. This is uh, this is a development outside of Boston, so I'm familiar with it. Um, yeah, it's an old it's an old industrial plant, a, a paint plant. Um, it was a brownfield, deserted for you know 40 years, literally just deserted. Um, and now the technology and the interest is there to restore these types of structures and to create eco-communities or eco-lofts or eco-developments. You'll be hearing more and more of these terms. Um, these types of developments have different sets of, of innovations that are applicable for the place or for the existing structure. Uh, there's no silver bullet. Um, these types of old mills have very thick walls with concrete floors, so you have a lot of uh, thermal mass there. Um, they have large, large windows which wouldn't necessarily be permitted uh, in a new structure, so you can take advantage of that, which these people have done. Um, one of their objectives is to have on-site wind uh, to provide the energy for the entire facility. And I think you're going to see a theme there coming up where new developments will be sort of expected, if not required, to provide their own electricity. Um, they have a bunch of other innovations, and all these innovations um, relate ultimately to energy. Uh, so the one million gallon rainwater retention canal, uh, as you know, at first take you could say, well, that's an environmental innovation um, to uh, separate the, the potable water from, uh, from the gray water system, for example, to retain uh, and recycle rainwater. But at the end of the day, that's an energy innovation. It's, it's, uh, it helps with cooling, it, it helps restore the aquifer, it's less uh, money treating water that doesn't need to be treated. Um, so almost any innovation, uh, environmental, really ultimately becomes an energy innovation. Um, there'll be an electric car fleet at, uh, um, at these lofts. Uh, which will be powered by the winds. All the units will have cross ventilation. There'll be community recycling. The, the concrete floors will be radiating heat. The, um, uh, at the bottom there, you see the picture of the model unit. So the units are for sale. You can go there and buy one. Um, so these are concrete floors, and they actually have the hot tubes running through the floor, the hot water tubes running through the floor. Um, again, in Houston, that maybe isn't necessary. But in Boston, something like that is necessary. And in every climate, in every situation, there'll be something unique. Um, in the top slide here, this shows uh, the part of Chelsea, which is the industrial ship channel area in Boston, where the property is. And this was, you know, abandoned uh, brownfield-like area. And I think there are similarities here with Houston or any other old industrial city that has these old ship channels. And um, you know, you can, you can see the natural gas tanks, well, okay, I'm going to try something. Okay, those are the natural gas tanks down there. Um, so that's, that's Boston sort of petro industry. And um, a lot of cities are reclaiming their industrial waterfront, and they're going to start doing so with, um, with low, low energy solutions. Okay, am I like totally running out of time? Okay. So it's just time to go really fast. Um, we're jumping now to BedZ. Um, uh, Beddington Zero Energy Development. As far as I know, this is the first such zero energy, quote unquote, carbon neutral housing development in the world, at least in the, in the modern world. Uh, it's 100 units and it's carbon neutral. It accounts for every single carbon molecule. Um, I've been there. It's a very neat place. The, the initial innovation is to reduce demand. You have to cut the demand by two-thirds at least 
In this case, they've cut demand almost by three quarters. Uh, he's got two foot thick walls. The heat for the entire, for the entire, um, the extra heat that's needed from an artificial source is a single 145 kilowatt um, combined heat and power plant that uses sustainably harvested wood chips. So one single um, 145 kilowatt plant provides the, excess, the necessary uh, supplemental heat for this 100 unit facility. And that's because it's designed so well. So it's a design challenge. You'll notice at the top there are these little funny shaped vents, they're called cowls. And because it's super insulated, you need, a, you need an air circulation system. That's one of the drawbacks of super insulation. But uh, it's accounted for appropriately here with these things. And when you go there, one of the things you'll, that's very cool is that when the wind changes direction, these things all change direction with it. And, and a hundred of them, every unit has one of these things, spin at the same, you know, rotate at the same time. It's sort of a cool effect, and it's part of what people in the future may be more familiar with. Um, this is the, the facility center for BEDSED. On the left is the power plant I just told you about. On, to the right of the power plant, that little greenhouse, is where they do the natural water treatment. The wastewater is treated right there on site, naturally, without any artificial chemicals. And uh, the excess heat from the power plant, of course, also fuels the greenhouse wastewater treatment. And underneath the, um, the greenhouse is the community center. Uh, here's a picture inside of the, uh, it's called the, the living machine. Um, by the way, this type of technology, this type of wastewater treatment technology was invented by a visionary biologist named John Todd. And the biggest such demonstration of this wastewater treatment was done in South Burlington, Vermont um, in the early 1990s at a facility that processed 80,000 gallons a day of raw municipal sewage. And the technical manager for that project was Jim Laurie, who was a graduate of the UHCL Futures Program. He was a colleague of mine, and he was a student of Dr. Bishop's. Um, the, they have a little parking lot there where you can plug in your electronic car. There are about six of them. We'll be seeing more of this. Okay, so now let's go from, um, from one to many. So the bed Z was, was, is a 100 unit um, development, and now it's time to really scale up. And this is what's beginning to happen uh, in Changsha, China. Uh, Changsha is the capital of Hunan province. As it says here, this is based on the bed Z model. Um, there'll be about 132 to three bedroom homes. Um, Okay, there's some statistics there you can look at. Uh, some of the key things here to see on this slide is the, uh, the orientation. We can look forward here. The, the objective here is to have high density without having the heat island effect. And I want to go back. And there are also sort of parks and there's a bike path. I don't know if you can see it there, but there's, I'll try this. Well, you, okay, there's a, bike, there's a bike path on the roof of, uh, of the public facility building. Here's, here's a cross section. So these people here are on the roof of, the, of like the commercial center and then there's a cross section of the residential center. So here's what the possible future of sky, skyscrapers, of high rises can look like. Um, this is another proposal from the same firm. Um, this is being considered for development in London. This isn't just a drawing. Uh, this is a real plan. They can give you the details about every single feature of it. The key thing to know is that this building generates its own power. This building does not have to be on the grid. Um, okay, I just have to, I guess, keep going. Just keep going. But um, 
because of time, but what I sort of want to show you here in the detail is that these are, these are vertical wind turbines. And uh, their assumption is, their, their power demand assumption is 750 to uh, 1,000 kilowatt hours per person per year. And <clears throat> so based on that, um, th that's the energy model they use for this. So this will provide that energy. Now taking it even one step further, there's a, th there's a theme here, by the way. The company that was behind those models I just showed you, uh, they're called Z Factory, Z for Zero Energy Development. They're based in London. And they also have a partner called ARUP, A-R-U-P, which is a huge international architectural firm. You've probably heard of them. They have offices here in Houston. And <clears throat> so there's a, there's a sort of partnership there. And ARUP is working on the master plan for the, for the Dong Tong project in China, which is earmarked to be the first truly sustainable city half a million people by 2030. This is a carbon neutral city. There'll be no uh, fossil fuels within it whatsoever. It will generate all its own power. Um, here is the satellite view of the location. It's on Chuming Island on the Yangtze River, which is a suburb of Shanghai. And um, you can actually see what I think is the beginning of the, of the development toward the, toward the bottom of the island there. And, um, it will be very cool to uh, use Google Satellite to just continue to zoom in and watch the progress of this thing over time. Um, <clears throat> here's, here's the master plan. Um, hold on one second. Can I go over? Okay. Uh, the boss tells me I can't go over. So uh, take my word for it. Just go look it up. Okay. <laughs> um, well, there's a lot more I could say about this, so you'll just have to trust me on it and, uh, and go look it up yourself. But this very well could be what the future of cities look like. Uh, we have to go to the next topic, which is, um, which is biorefineries. And I want to bring your attention. I'm going to go two minutes over. I want to bring your attention to um, the well, first of all, I thought it was interesting that the National Geographic story, that's this month, that's the October issue. So it almost seemed like it was made for this conference. But the one on the left is the one I really want to bring your attention to, uh, Living Without Oil. Um, because this entire, uh, most of this issue is, is focused on the petrochemical substitution industry. So it, it's not talking about fuels, it's talking about petrochemicals. So the plastics, the solvents, the detergents, the, the everything. I mean, the varnishes, everything is petrochemicals. And Houston, of course, is a petrochemical um, city. And <clears throat> this entire issue, well, not the entire issue, but, but several parts of it are dedicated to looking at how biomass-based uh, plastic and chemical industries can replace the petrochemical industry. Well, that slide got screwed up. But basically, um, there on your left, those are the derivatives of the petrochemical industry that anyone in Houston is familiar with. And those are the building blocks for all the industrial and household, household products we're used to. The uh, biochemical industry is going to start to create those same things with sugars, starches, fats, and proteins. I'll let these slides sort of be um, self-explanatory. Um, the biochemical industry is, has many benefits over the petrochemical industry for plastics and these sorts of things. Um, uh, quickly, what I want to bring your attention to here is that the red, um, pie, the red slice of the pie is the volume of fossil fuel that that currently goes into the petrochemical industry, so it's quite small, so you think it's not significant. However, the numbers to the right there show the actual gross value, the market value for the product. And so the market value for the petrochemical product, which only takes 3.4% of all fossil fuels, is almost exactly the same as the market value for all fuels based on fossil fuels. So there's a huge 
huge um, incentive to work into chemicals as opposed to fuels. So that's definitely something that can affect the future of Houston's economy because uh, it's also much easier to adapt to a bio, a bio um, plastic, for example. For example, I don't care if this pen is made from plastic, from biomass, or fossil fuels, whereas, whereas um, if, to put ethanol in your car, if you have to change your car, if the end user needs to make a change, then that's going to be a bigger hurdle. End users don't have to make a change to get, uh, chemical, to get chemical products made from biomass. Okay, so I have to wrap up um, very quickly. We are seeing a new breed of chemical companies, and I'll sort of uh, end it with a joke. Um, it, people remember George Carlin from the 70s, the comedian from the 70s. Um, he, he once had a line, something like, um, Goodyear pancakes. You wouldn't want to buy Goodyear pancakes. Well, in the future, you may be buying Aunt Jemima tires. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Good job. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ten. Ten. Thank you very much, Seth. Um, obviously, the petrochemical industry is a huge industry here, aside from the refining and fossil fuels industry, and it's nice to see that we might have some, some actual substitutes for that. But most importantly, in terms of our theme, imagine expecting every home, every building, to be energy self-sufficient. I mean, our grandkids and our great-grandkids are going to be astounded that we just expected to turn the lights on and they would just come on. That's the kind of, the present is an unusual place in the history of the world. It was never this way and it will not be this way again. And that's really one of the, uh, one of the areas that we want to talk about. I was going to kind of brag on Houston or criticize Houston one way or the other, but I'd, I'd really like to point out to you kind of a summary one summary in terms of what I've heard this, this week, and I think you should carry away. The top left-hand corner, we've got oil and the existing resources. They create a certain amount of energy available or energy supply, and we get out of that the benefits. We get the products, the transportation, the electricity, the air conditioning, and all of those things. Following peak oil and following the twilight of the oil industry, 2040, 2050, we will have the existing sources, which is nuclear and coal and many new sources. They will provide a certain degree of supply, and but they probably will not match the benefit of the energy available that the oil industry has provided. We will not fill up that gap. We will not have enough wedges, I don't believe, to do that. But what we do have, is technical and, and uh, new demand efficiencies, the kind of buildings. My, my image is a family, a family that finds a treasure, a family of 10 or 12 people that have an almost endless, what they think is an endless treasure, and they just spend money, and they just spend it and spend it and spend it. And finally somebody pointed out, said, hey, the treasure's about half over. Don't you think we better start thinking about how we save it and use it and then we be have efficiency. So I think built into our system, I mean, when, when I read Amory Levins, my eyes cross with all the gigawatts and the hits, it's, 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 it's all that kind of stuff. But I can't imagine with it's been so available and so relatively free that we don't have the 80 to 90 percent efficiencies that he's talking about, simply as a plausible future that when we squeeze this thing down and smart about it, just like the, the building Seth was talking about, we're going to find enormous efficiencies. Even then, we may not have the benefits that uh, we have today, and that's where behavior is the flex. As we pointed out this morning, it is not always going to be a matter of choice. I mean, I love the first say, saying, a compelling, low-cost product, great. But again, we may be forced into behavior. Some of the behavior change will be voluntary, but a lot of it will be forced. So to me, those three, the sources, the efficiencies, and the behaviors square the circle of peak oil. It is all kind, it's not just source, it's not just, it's not just efficient, it's not just, when you hear somebody say it, it's just all about, it's not. It's all those three will finally square the circle, and we will have a world in which people live, and I believe happily, without the oil industry that we've had. I'm going to skip over the Houston part. Houston, in terms of business ventures, doesn't have any. <laughs> 
in the, in the alternative energy and efficiencies area. We hope they do. We've got two great universities and one great uh, research center. The Houston Area Research Center was founded by George Mitchell. And some of you attended the Woodlands Conferences in the 1970s. I mean, I'm, I'm having deja vu all over again. 30 years later, it all kind of is coming back, the, all of that stuff. And George, just like with Matt Simmons and, and, and Boone Pickens, one of the real visionaries of the energy industry, and we're really seeing his legacy being brought out. And we have the government programs, as you pointed out, as we pointed out, and the mayor being showing them, showing all of that. But let me end up with uh, a, a summary. Is Houston a cyclic city? Is Houston destined for its version of the Rust Belt, its version of the auto industry, its version of the collapse of its central core economy? And I believe there's going to be a transition, no doubt, and that transition is going to be difficult. But the earlier we begin talking about it, the earlier we begin preparing for it, the less deep and the less chaotic and the less painful that transition will be. Some people call this the Indian summer of the oil industry. Lots of money, lots of, uh, lots of, lots of uh, profits, but are we really experiencing the very end of this particular age? And let me leave you with three words. Productivity, of course, output over input. And the inputs in our society have been very largely determined by that wonderful fuel that the gentleman this morning talked about, that wonderful liquid, high density, unbelievable stuff. And what we've done with it is created more stuff, better stuff, and we've lowered cost and we have shorter time. Now, of course, we're saying, take that out of the picture. Where are we going to get the productivity? So it's going to be information, uh, I mean, uh, uh, technical, efficient productivity, and also doing more with less is going to be, for the first time in history, we might actually have a society which decreases its per capita energy use and in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a way that people. This is, a, this is a chart that we got from a local Houston business energy guy and it's the second word that I want to leave you with, productivity and complexity. I love and I'll have a, a the, there's a picture there, Steve Andrews' picture that he got from Matt Simmons. Let me, go, let me go back and show you that one. It's kind of hard to see on there. That's his picture. He's been talking about it so I'll show you the picture, the silver bullet versus the silver BBs. I love that concept. Everybody is looking for the solution because for all of our life we've always had the next solution. It was wood and then it was coal and then it was oil and then it was nuclear. It was one one after the other. It's not. It's all of these things. We hope that through the combination of new sources, efi technical efficiencies, and behavior change that we can have a civilization, a life, without the oil industry. And finally then, there is adaptation. Behavior, people will make do no matter what we hand them over the period of time. You hate the journey, but you'll like the destination. The transition could be a depression. It could be a global depression, and very few people have really gone that far, but I think that's a plausible scenario. We might be the depression generation to the second half, just like our, our, my father was in the depression of the 30s, we may be in the depression of the 20s. And yet at the end, People will be glad they are arrived where they are because they will be using many sources with very high efficiencies. And they will have less, they'll have less material things, but as a matter of fact, I don't think they're going to mind that. You know, why did you have so much stuff? Why did you go move around so much? Why did you do all this kind of stuff? More intangibles will be valuable, more awareness and self-sufficiency. They will think of us, as I said, as a nice place to visit and read about, but they will be mystified at our use of energy and why we used it so much. So my recommendation, read the limits to growth. <laughs> 1973 publication, somebody told me it was the best, bestseller nonfiction book of the whole 1970s. There have been two editions since then. We read this in class, the 30-year update published in, in 1990, 19, 2003. And they, they, didn't, they said the peak, believe it or not, was 2015. That's a, that's a number, that's a year I've heard about a lot. The, so their, their updates are saying, okay, still on track for overshoot and collapse. Seth is creating a new website on the, for discussion of Houston after oil. We certainly urge you to get on there. And the rest really is up to us. The sooner we act, as has been said many times, the less painful 
and the less deep the transition will be. And I hope we can get begin. I hope peak oil, Sally, in five years from now is not the, uh, the red flag that it is today, as I say, in polite company. This is our future. This is our children's future. It's our grandchildren's future without oil. And it's really, really serious business. And it's been a pleasure sharing what I could as a futurist with you to give you something to reflect on as you leave Houston and go back to your uh, home places, cities, and countries. Thank you very much.